I want to thank God for this opportunity to be here once more. And uh, today we have a special because before I sing, oh, let me sing. Now, which song? Because I was not prepared to sing. Maybe let me first read this before I think what I'm going to sing. On Thursday, uh, Thursday evening, from 8 to 9, we are notified that uh, we do have an online meeting. Normally, it's a Bible study. But this Thursday, we have a small alteration because we want to be in the presence of the Lord in prayer. And it is for the whole family. And I see maybe we only have a third of us connecting. And I know most of us, we have the gadgets, we have the net, and I want to challenge you because uh, some of us maybe cannot make it for a, a physical meeting on uh, Wednesday. But we are only requesting you to connect and pray together at the comfort of your house. Kindly, let us take time to connect and to pray together as a family. So Thursday, 8 p.m. to 9 p.m. It's a one-hour session where we connect and join together to pray in prayer online. I am done with that. We also want to thank God for some a good number of us who are going back to school, especially those of us who are in boarding schools, our children, and I would love to ask them to, to stand, maybe, now let me not start it that way. We are going to pray for you as we go to, as we release the children to go to their classes. But today, I have a very special friend who has requested me to give her an opportunity to come and see. That is why I mentioned singing. So I want to welcome none other than my friend, Abigail Karaoke. Let's celebrate Abigail. She, comes. she requested me on Sunday. On Sunday, first I want to sing. So I don't know, I don't even know what song she's going to sing. We do not know what song Abby is singing, but you can be sure she has prepared for the song. And I will just stand here to be proud to be associated. Welcome, Abby. Thank you. Let's celebrate Abigail. Thank you, God. 
May the Lord continue giving or empowering that gift. We really appreciate the gift of our Sunday school because this is the gift that will serve the church of Jesus Christ in the times to come. Therefore, we are so, so proud of you, Abigail. Uh, and we encourage as many of us that can uh, do such. A present a verse, you can uh, come and sing. You can do whatever gift that you think the Lord has given to you to serve into his kingdom. And when our children start realizing how great and mighty our God is, it is such a blessing. Amen. So I want to request those of us in our midst who are going back to school, are in boarding schools, kindly you can stand on your feet. We would love to pray with you as we release our children to go back, to go to their classes. Those of us going to school from one, from two, from three, from four, do we have primary who are in boarding? Yeah, all of them can stand. All right, church, shall we take this opportunity to pray? Our God and our Father, in the name of Jesus, we sincerely want to thank you for giving to us our children and bringing them to a level that they can go out there and pursue their studies. You've taken them through most of them primary schools and they are here now getting ready to go back for another term in a new year. We pray that God, you may give to them your grace even to approach their new classes in confidence, knowing that it is you that enables us to pursue that what you have called us to. We pray that God, you're going to enable them even to focus on their studies and to concentrate. And Lord, we pray that you may give them victory. Above all, we commit them to you into, uh, into your hands for your keeping, that you may watch over them, that you may give them safety and help, that, Lord, you may give them favor. In the eyes of their teachers, in the eyes of their colleagues, we pray that these ones are going to enjoy a very, very special favor because they are their children. We also pray for our uh, the parents, some who may be in need and they may be wondering, from where the school fees from where the school fees will come from lord may you open their doors that they may be provided for for the glory and for the honor of your holy name we pray that god as we release our children to go to their classes you're going to be with them speaking to them ministering to them at a level that they are going to engage with you to feel that your presence is upon them, speaking to them at a very individual level. We thank you, blessed Lord, for every teacher who has committed themselves to make an impact on the children. It is our prayer that God, you may bless them and cause them to influence the lives of these children in the way that you desire of them. We also want to thank you for our offerings. Thank you that we have a privilege where we can partner with you, with what you've given to us. You've given to us resources, money, our jobs and our businesses. Lord, from where we get, we know it is an honor. And now we commit to you just a small percentage of what you've given to us. And we want to give it into your hands that it may be used for the glory and for the honor of your kingdom. Even to do great things for your work and for your ministry, O oh God. As we give unto you, we give it with thanksgiving, asking that you may continue blessing us and opening greater doors for us. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Children, together with your teachers, you are now free to go to your classes. Let's celebrate our children as they go to their classes together with their teachers. Right, I'm giving the children time to settle. Uh, and a number of us who are very far to come, Liara, thank you. Thank you for 
coming nearer. We, the Lord opened greater doors for us. I see we are using some seats that are meant for the Sunday school, so we have to pray. I see that the teachers are making some provision to have the seats go to the Sunday school. We are trusting the Lord to even give us more seats so that we do not have to move with the seats when people, uh, when their children are moving to Sunday school. If you are visiting with us, if you, uh, you have not been here for this year, I want to take this opportunity to inform you or to invite you into our theme for the year. And I want to ask us, church, that we may uh, read our theme for the year 2023 and let us do it together. It is displayed uh, here in front. So let us go together. Theme 2023 it says, Now let's, let's say this with conviction. Now let's go once more. Right. That is our theme for the year 2023. And Brock, let the rivers flow. And I want to just do a recap very quickly. The theme comes from uh, John, the book of John chapter 7, 37 and 38. That says, on the day the last day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried out, saying, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. And that we had started, we started by singing living water, living water, I will never thirst again. And for sure, when we have the living water, Jesus tells the Samaritan woman, he who drinks this water, you know, the one that was at the well, will thirst again. But he who drinks the water that I give, he will never thirst again. Instead of him thirsting, out of his heart, there will be rivers or fountains of living water flowing to eternal life. We're going to come back to that portion. That is our, our theme verse. And so from the beginning of the year, on A, we answered the question, if anyone thirsts. So we talked about acknowledging our need that we thirst. Deciding to go to the fountain that, will, that has the ability to quench our thirst. And we said that you honor the right invitation. And that day we ended with a commitment to drink or to take the appropriate action. He said, if you remember, that there are many of us seated just next to the water, yet they are thirsty. And he said, if you've got, you've got to acknowledge, you've got to decide what fountain or what answer or invitation to answer, and then commit yourself to appropriately act, drink from that fountain. Last Sunday, we went further on that portion of scripture and we looked at the promise that comes with those that drink because Jesus promises out of his heart out of his belly there will come rivers of living water when your thirst in life is quenched by him Jesus makes you means to where or through which he satisfies the thirsty world. We say that practical ministry is an overflow of what happens within. Finally, we say that the highest fulfillment of a believer is when the flow of their faith transforms the circumstances in which they live. And we looked at the woman at the well. That is where we ended. But in between there is a short few words that Jesus said that I want us to look at. So today, we are looking at the words that Jesus said, 
as the scripture has said. And we ask, we want to ask ourselves, what is it that Jesus was referring to? Because uh, remember, at that point, Jesus had the Old Testament. The people in the times of Jesus, like I have said here before, the people that were there and they wrote the scriptures, they didn't write that we are writing the word of God. They were living their ordinary, everyday lives. So Jesus didn't have the book of Matthew, John, Mark, and all that in the New Testament. But he had the Old Testament as it is, and probably a little bit more. So we ask, what is this that Jesus was talking about, as the scripture says? I think having said that, I have created enough background to where, from where we are coming, and now we engage into a, 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 a moment of thinking what is it that was in the mind of Jesus? We get into the mind of Jesus. And what an excitement to know or to just, you know, just shed some light into the mind of Jesus at this particular time. What is it that he was speaking or that he was thinking about the river? And I want to uh, just do an overview. The Old Testament, just a few verses at the beginning or from the beginning we see a scripture in the book of Genesis chapter 2 that talks about a river. Genesis chapter 2 from verse 1 uh, so, sorry from verse 10 to 14. I'm just going to read verse 10 but I encourage you to read at your free time to take time to read forever from verse 10 to 14. This is just at the beginning of life the way we know it. God had just created Adam and Eve and he placed them at the garden of Eden. And now as God is talking about the garden, these words come up. A river watering the garden flowed from Eden. From there it was separated into four rivers or into four headwaters. I don't know which one you are using. Oh yeah, into four riverheads. We're not going to go to the details of the rivers that separated. But one thing is clear at this point in time, that at the Garden of Eden, there was a river. That could be a possibility that Jesus was talking about that river. But then, after some time, we all know the story of the fall. Adam and Eve fell off from the grace of God. And they uh, were sent out from the garden. And therefore, they were separated from the river of God. The river that was... The purpose of that river was to water the garden and to, to sustain life in the garden, sustain the life of Adam and his family, sustain the life of the trees, including the tree of life. It was a life-giving river. Jesus could as well have been talking about the river at the garden of Eden. But we see the children that Adam, together with his wife, together with his uh, family, sinned. And they were blocked from accessing the river. And for thousands of years, we see a man, mankind, or Adam and his race that has no access to the river. But one thing remained in the mind and in the heart of men, that God had provided a river that was to supply and to sustain the lives of men. So, maybe before we get to that, again, let's go to the end of life, of the, 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 the prediction, the prophecy that comes in the Bible. 
So we see a river at the beginning of life. But let's again go straight. Let's shuttle straight to the end. Revelation 22. Again, verse 1. This is at the end of life. I read, I read verse 1. Then the angel showed me the river of life as clear as crystal flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb. Now we see at the beginning there was a river and at the end there will be a river. Now, for us living in this generation, we are living in between the paradise that was lost when Adam sinned and the paradise that is to come when Jesus, the second Adam, will come again and give to us a paradise that will be forever and eternally we will be in that paradise. But in between here, between the paradise lost and the paradise that is yet to come, here we are. Our generation needs a river. So together with, uh, with us are the prophets that God had started ministering to about a river. And there are several, there are a number who talked about a river. Jesus could have been talking about any one of the prophets. Or he could have been talking about the river in the beginning or the river at the end. Please remember that life to Jesus, because he is God, immortal, eternal, the beginning, you know, he sees the end from the beginning. So he could have been seeing the river of life that will be written about later in the book of Revelation. But he said about what the scripture has said. So I want us to take time and read through quite a portion of scripture the book of Ezekiel chapter 47. This is one among the prophets who had talked about a river. Chapter 47 from, from verse 1 to 12. I, I might skip a few verses. I, I, I don't know how you are going to project, but let me go through it. But I, I am requesting you take your time. Read through those that portion of scripture from verse 1 to 12. But because of, in the interest of time, allow me to skip several uh, of the scripture, of the verses in between, so that uh, we will be able to keep our time. The man brought me back to the entrance of the temple, and I saw water coming from under the threshold of the temple toward the east. For the temple faced east. He then brought me out through the north gate and led me around the outside to the outer gate facing east. And the water was trickling from the south side. Verse 3. As a man went east with a measuring line in his hand, he measured off a thousand cubits and then led me through the water that was ankle deep. Verse 4. He measured off another 1,000 cubits and led me through water that was ankle deep. Sorry, knee deep. He measured off another 1,000 and led me through water that was up to the waist. He measured off another 1,000. But now it was a river that I could not close because the water had risen and was deep enough to swim in a river that no one could close. He asked me, son of man, do you see this? Then he led me back to the bank of the river, to the bank of the river. When I arrived there, I saw a great number of trees on each side of the river where it entered the Dead Sea, I've Keep uh, verse eight, where it keep, where it enters the Dead Sea. When it empties into the sea, 
the salty water there became fresh. Swarms of living creatures will live whenever the river flows. There will be large number of numbers of fish because this river flows there and makes salty water fresh. So, where the river flows, everything will live. But the swamps and the marshes will not become fresh. They will be left for salt. Fruit trees, verse 12, fruit trees of all kinds will grow on both banks of the river. Their leaves will not wither, nor will their fruit fail. Every month they will bear fruit because the water from the sanctuary flows to them. Their fruit will become, sorry, their fruit will serve for food and their leaves for healing. All right. That is our portion of the scripture that I want us to take a few minutes and observe. What? This is a possibility that Jesus could have been talking about this particular prophet. And many of the research indicates that he was talking about this. But I wanted to, I, I started by saying he could have been talking about any among the levers that the prophets have uh, talked had talked about. I want us to make some observations. Number one, man, what should be planted up upon our minds is the source of the river. I saw coming out. Coming out from under the threshold of the temple, the river that Ezekiel saw was coming from the threshold of the temple. At the threshold of the temple is the altar. And the altar is a representation, a pointer of the worship. And when Jesus is talking about making livers to come out of us, I do not want us to lose focus that we are discussing what Jesus is saying. And we are doing a parallel here between what Ezekiel says and what Jesus says. So Ezekiel says that the water is not only coming from the temple, but it is coming from the threshold. The threshold of the temple is the altar of sacrifice. The altar where we go and worship the Lord where the sacrifice was spread in worship to God. And for the river to flow, it got to come from the very bottom of our heart. Let's now listen to Jesus talking about this same concept to the woman at the well. John 4, 23 and 24. It says, Yet a time is coming, and now is. When true worshippers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for this kind, the Father of worshippers, the Father seeks. God is spirit, and his worshippers must worship in spirit and in truth. For me to create some background, let's go back to the well where we ended last last week, because this is the same same place that Jesus is bringing about worship. When the woman is talking about the water, Jesus comes to him, to her and tell and, and, and request of her, please give me a drink. And this woman gets confused. How do you, a Jew, ask for water from me as a Samaritan? You know, Jesus can see right through the life of this woman. And Jesus is not interested with the water, but he brings, you know, the agenda of Jesus is to raise a people that are worshipping in truth and in spirit. When the woman is talking about the water, Jesus is talking about true worshippers that are worshipping in spirit and in truth. So he says that a time has come. It is now. When the true worshippers must worship God in spirit and in truth. 
before your fountain, before the springs of water comes out of you, it's got to be coming from a heart that truly worship God in spirit and in truth. Praise be the, to the name of the Lord. So Jesus is talking about the true worship as the threshold where this fountain must spring. If it is about anything else, if it's about you, if it's about me, it cannot be a flow that will transform people's lives. Jesus tells us that from deep within, those that drink from me, out of them flows rivers of living water. This must be true worship from the bottom of our hearts. For you, my friends, to make an impact where you live, for you to make an impact where you work, your life must be all given to God. Given to God to glorify Him. That worship is not what happens here on Sunday. And today, the worship team has done a good job. Thank you. Uh, and people that were doing that are not very, uh, the common ones. We, we normally see Mukami in the backup. We normally see Dennis in the backup. But today they have done a wonderful job. Let's celebrate them. Thank you. Thank you. Worship team. But that, what happens here on Sunday morning, is not the worship. Jesus is talking about our lives being the altar from where the life, from where these springs of living water will flow. Remember the Old Testament, the temple was physical, like what we have here as a church. But Jesus says in the New Testament, you are the temple. From that temple, the temple that is you, the temple that is me, from that temple, there must flow rivers of living water. And we get uh, now to look at what Ezekiel. I have only three points, and the three points are very easy to remember. We are looking at uh, the progressive nature of the river. Secondly, we are looking at the persistence to follow to the deep. And thirdly, we are looking at the productivity where the river flows. So Ezekiel, verse 2 of chapter 47, he talks about the way the river starts. He says, I saw some water coming from the threshold of the temple. But the water that I saw was not a river. It was a trickle. A trickle is just water that is dripping little by little. That is where the river begins. And our lives, so that God may build up a river, it starts with a trickle. A good number of us, me included. I remember the day that I got saved, it was a Sunday evening. It looked, even to me, as a joke. I had lived for the whole of my life with a mother that loved the Lord. And I knew for sure that it is a matter of time someday I'm also heading this direction. But that evening, I tried to sleep in my cubicle. You know, the generation of nowadays, you do not have cubicles. Now maybe you have cubicles in school, but not those ones. Okay, we call them cubes. Uh, when a uh, young man in my generation, and the generation before me and after me, they can only see a few who are slightly, not slightly, I think all of you are we, we. Yeah, 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 that some a greater number of you are way behind. So, but when we went through the rite of passage, you couldn't sleep in your mother's house. So I pity you, Nairobi. 
Nairobians. So sad. If you still go through parades of passage and you, you sleep in your mother's house. So for us, you could have a one room, a one room small house, that a structure that will be built just a, a few meters from your father and your mother's house. And I tried to sleep that day, that night, in my cubicle, and it, it couldn't work. I had to look for somebody to pray for me. And I left my house slowly, at night, no torch in the darkness. But I think like that day, those days was very, very nice. In the darkness, I made my way to one a young man like me who had just bought, gotten born again. And may the Lord bless him as he does ministry. And I told him, I have not come for many things, I have come to get saved. But it looked a joke. The following day, I remember I told my cousin that I got saved last night. And he told me, don't worry. Uh, we also knew another cousin of ours that was called Waingaro who had gotten saved. And he was not in the race anymore. So he told me, don't worry, that happens a lot. You know? There are people, at, many people at your age who get saved many times. It is easy to get saved. But there are things that are very easy to do. Eh? Like uh, quitting smoking. Those of us who are smokers, you know how, how, how easy it is. Somebody told me that quitting smoking is so easy. I have, I have called it quit over 20 times. I mean, you are not getting the joke. But, uh, <laughs> and he told me, don't worry. We have seen many in your, at your age who get saved. And they get saved. And they get saved again and again. It looked like it was nothing. Many of my friends gave me a few days. And they thought for sure, this guy. And, and the, the, you know, the way you know me, I like, I, I love like, you know. It is just, I love life, I enjoy life. And even then, I enjoyed life. They thought there is no way somebody who enjoys life this much, who loves life, can remain in the Lord. And they started as a trickle that everybody thought is coming to an end. But it later went to a, an uncle deep. Later on, went to a needy, and much later, it was at the waist level. That time, things started taking shape. When I began life uh, as a born-again Christian, I think the only person who thought, who made it a big thing, was my mother. Because she was praying. And you know, okay, a good number of you who have been with me, uh, there is a song that I used to sing for her, thank you mama for praying for me. Because if she didn't pray, for sure I was headed the wrong direction. But I remember, he, she was not home when I got saved. Uh, so when she came, I told her, by the way, I got saved. And we were in an evening just before supper. And you should have seen what happened that day. We were just the two of us. She broke in tongues, lifted up her hands and prayed for me and thanked God that finally I had come to the right. Started seeing higher. So this thing was serious. <laughs> I mean, how does my mother speak? You know, my, my mother could speak in tongues. And, uh, you know, I had it words for, okay. I had it words for a minute. But she was a wonderful, wonderful lady. So I could, I started seeing how serious it was when she started speaking in tongues and celebrating what the Lord has done. But after, after time, many people who had given me days and have given me weeks, they now look at it and see, okay, this liver was serious. But I pity a good number of us Christians. Those of us who after years and years of confessing this salvation, have their salvation or have their, have their livers still at the ankle deep. 
as the trickle that comes from your life. Water that is not enough for anybody to even wash or cleanse their hands, leave alone. Bath. Ezekiel looked at this and said the river got to be progressive, starting with a trickle that may not look like anything. But friends, we must have a commitment. We must know and follow this from a trickle to go to the next level. We are called not to be static in our faith. Our faith is not about the testimony that I am born again and it ends there. Our lives are meant to be transformative in, in places where we live in. You don't know what your trickle is doing. Are there people that are watering their gardens with their trickle? I'm sure a trickle is not enough for you. It's not enough for your family. A trickle can only be some drops, little drops. But I thank God there are those of us who have caught the vision that Jesus has. Not about a trickle, not a small water in a cup. Not even a pipe. You know, a river is a representation of limitless flow. You know, when the water flows in a tap, you could very easily close it. You could very easily divert. And it could be a river, there could be a pipe down here where I am standing. And nobody can see it. I can't even feel it. Jesus is calling our lives to become not a trickle, but a river that will be noticed by the impact that it has. I want to challenge you. How much has your life, has your river touched others for God? If you are still in a trickle, I want to quench, uh, I want to arouse in you a desire to get deeper. Because the master, Jesus, has a way that he has provided for anybody that desires to go deeper. He has a way of leading us deeper. Finally, from the trickle, the river ends into a river that no one, you know, initially Ezekiel talked about a river that I could not close. Maybe he was not a good swimmer. Uh, last month, two months ago maybe, I, I, I happened to join a group of friends as we sat somewhere at the bank of Oliver Nile. And uh, the common men, okay, the, the, the the rockers of that particular village would very easily sweep, uh, uh, swim across the river and we started asking ourselves, how long, how, how, how far can you go into the river? And I was there in my friends, I can close this thing. <laughs> they all thought it was a joke, but I'm sure my wife didn't want to hear this testimony. So for the sake of my peace, <laughs> at home, Let it rest there. <laughs> so the river, Ezekiel started by doubting his own ability to swim across. But he later clarifies and says, the river that I am talking about, no one could close. You know, no one including the most uh, confident swimmer would close that river. This is a river that no one could contain. A river that no one could stop. A river no situation could contain. Friends, our lives are called to be a river. Rivers of living water will flow out of your lives. 
Levers that no one could stop. Levers could no one could contain. Levers that has to do what God has appointed for them to accomplish. Praise be to the name of the Lord. Levers that no frustration in life can stop. Because they are the levers ordained by God. In John chapter 4 and verse 14, I'm reading through a contemporary English version. Jesus tells the Samaritan woman, the water I give you will become to that person a flow, a flowing fountain that gives eternal life. Friends, Jesus looks at you and he says, whoever believes the water that I give to them, in them there will be a fountain, a flowing fountain that gives eternal life. May I challenge you? How many people have you given eternal life from the river that flows from you? We are called to be a fountain that will go touching lives, sharing what happened to you, sharing the transformation that happened in your life, and men and women will come to knowing eternal life, to knowing God, because of the fountain that comes from you. Last week, we ended by saying that there is something that no one can argue with, your own testimony. The conviction that you are born again. When you go out and tell people about the love of Christ, nobody can question your testimony. People can argue about whether God exists. People can argue, you know, whether to belong to certain religion or, or not to belong. But one thing is sure. When I say I am born again, when I say that Jesus gave me the peace of mind, when I say that Jesus gave me the hope for life, you can never argue with it. And friends, this is the fountain that we are called to go out and propagate the gospel, sharing it with those that do not know him. The rivers that Jesus gives will become a fountain that gives eternal life. How many? Have you given eternal life? Thank God. Twist in this congregation, I can see a number who I shared with the gospel of Jesus. And now I do not have to push them. They have seen the beauty of following Jesus. And they are the ones sharing with others eternal life. And this is what will count when we go to heaven, can't fail to imagine when I get to heaven. Without naming names, I see people that will be behind me in this congregation. And my line will be growing taller. Is it longer or taller now? The line grows, okay. Longer, not taller. All right, sorry. English came with a ship. And it ran very far from our house. So I can see many that that day will come and say, this man told me about the Lord and the life or the spring of life in him gave me eternal life. How many have you told and shared with this gospel that transformed the lives of men? Second observation. Persistent to follow into the deep. Now, if you go through the portion of scripture we have read seven times, there appears the word, he led me. Seven, not once, not twice, not thrice. Seven good times. Ezekiel is led from one level to another. Friends, he had to be committed to following into the deep. 
Remember the words of Jesus. That he says in Matthew 4 and verse 19, Come, follow me. I will make you. You know, Jesus does not only make the people who just come to him, but the people who come to him and stick and follow him, he makes them. Friends, our Lord Jesus desires to make you. He desires to make you, but you've got to be committed to follow him. So Ezekiel was committed. We do not see him at any one time asking the question, I have followed too much. But he follows from when it was a trickle, follows to the ankle deep, uh, follows to the knee deep, to the waist deep, to a river he couldn't swim, and to a river that no one could close. He was consistent in following. Times of trouble, are you consistent? Are you committed to follow the Lord? And a good number of us, when sufferings come, I mean, even I were in a place some two weeks ago when somebody prayed, uh, I don't know whether she was serious or not, and she said, if God you don't help me this time, I will never pray you again. Don't know whether she meant it. Because I after that she still prayed. So I in the times when life is not promising, are you committed to follow? For Ezekiel, maybe because he doesn't sound like he was a very good swimmer, it is not very interesting for those who are not swimmers to get to a water that is above. The knee deep. In my small life, in my short life, I have been training a few people how to swim. And one of them, who happens to be my son, who is my student, or who was my student of swimming, people have different ways that they react to water. But this young man who led you in worship this morning, had really big trouble going beyond knee deep. He was so hesitant. And I can see Ezekiel at the point where he knew he doesn't know how to swim, getting very hesitant. But even when he knew like his life would be in danger, he follows. For seven times, he was read into different level in the river. But for my son, later on, he became a very confident swimmer. He's, the, he's one of the best swimmers you can get. And I'm not campaigning for him. If you need training for swimming, talk to this young man. He swims very well. Uh, courtesy of the fan. Anyway. <laughs> it may be the mother cheering. <laughs> can see Ezekiel getting hesitant. Do I still need to follow after it gets beyond needy? But he is persistent. He is not about to leave it until the full experience. And the problem of the church today are men that are following half-heartedly. Women that are following half-heartedly. They follow to some rend and they feel this thing is becoming too tedious. This thing is becoming too risky. This thing is not what I expected. Friends, we are called to follow into the deep where real life happens. Our Christian faith has levels. Could you turn to your neighbor and tell them there are levels to this? What level are you in, friend? What level are you in? Are you still at the tri uh, at the trickling level? Are you still at the anchor deep and still saying we are going to church, we are Christians, we are saying praise the Lord here, but you remain at the anchor deep. And some of us have gone to another level and we are now 
and are needy and we are serving. You think because you are serving, you have experienced everything. And it is great to serve friends. It's great to serve in the church. It's great to serve in the worship. It's great to serve as a nurse. But friends, there are levels to this. It's until we are completely immersed in the river that no one could swim through, no one could contain. That is when we experience what Jesus desires of us. Jesus' desire of you is that you may experience the abundance that no one can ever contain. Praise be to the name of the Lord. We must finish. But I want to, de- to arouse in you the desire to get deep. The desire to be a throw that no one can ever contain. I want to look finally at the productivity where the river throws. Verse 6 says, then he led me back to the banks of the river. When I arrived there, can you see how big the river was? You know, it's not something Ezekiel could see at the, when he was at the middle of the river. He needed the age or the man to lead him. And when I arrived there, so he arrived there. And what does he see? When I arrived there, I saw a great number of trees, each on, on each side of the river. Where? On each side of the river. Let's leave it there. Friends, where this river flowed, where this river passed through, from both sides of the river, life started changing. There were trees, not just a few of them, but multiples and multiples of trees, suggesting life, suggesting productivity. But the greater is yet to come. Verse 8 says, where it enters the Dead Sea, when it empties into the sea, the salty water becomes fresh. Feel like I want to get excited this morning. Normally, I know a good number of us have gone to the ocean. Okay, if you have not talked to James, he comes from not very far from the ocean. Uh, no, yeah. I'm lost. We may need to have James 1 and James 2 because when I say James the instrumentalist, by the way, the new James, our brother, James, who is uh, on the drums, he's also James. And so I don't know, James, who is 1 and who is 2? So our old James is James 1 and then James 2. When I talk about James, I'm talking about James 1. He comes from Mombasa. And he will tell you, when fresh water comes into the sea, the water of the river turns salty. I'm you. But look at this river. The Bible says that when the river enters into the sea, it is the sea that converts to become fresh. How excited I, 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 I feel when I think about the water in the sea and the water that is in the river, it is incomparable. The water in the sea is much more in volume, but the water that gets in there the Bible says, as soon as it enters, as soon as it empties, it is the sea that converts. Friends, you have what it takes to convert your family into a freshness that has never been experienced before. Yes, the family where you come from is evil. We all know. There are drunkards in that family. They are inconsiderate men. They are men that do not fear God. 
But as long as you empty what you have in your life, the sea, though big, though looking like so intimidating, your liver has what it takes to convert the sea into freshness. Hallelujah. Do not fear. The stream, the fountain of God froze from within you. And you have what it takes to change the river into the freshness. As far as, as, as if that is not enough, swarms of living creatures will live whenever the river froze. There will be life when the dead see why it is called dead is because there is no life. Maybe you are looking at your family and you are wondering what happened to our family? What will be the end of it? Two weeks ago, my wife and some friends, uh, we were talking about another friend. We are not backbiting. He was actually in front of us, so we were even if we were front biting. <laughs> and uh, without naming names, talk about those old days, and we said how you couldn't go into that home because if you went there, the all that the mother will be talking about is who has bewitched who, who has bewitched me, and who has, you know, it was all about witchcraft and witchcraft and witchcraft. But there was a trickle that turned into a river that changed the sea. Praise be to the name of the Lord. Amen. Friends, if the family you come from happens to be like that one, that all you talk about, ni waganga wa kienyeji, na wengine wa kare, na wengine wa Kisasa, kuna waganga wa kisasa by the way. wa kienyeji ni wa broya. I don't know. If all that happens in your family, the stories that goes around me about who has bewitched who. You look at life and who is what is happening out there scares you. Friends, there is a liver in you. You do not have to think. Who has bewitched you? Many people think because it is not working. You tried a business, it didn't work. Tried a career, it's not working. You've tried everything, it's not working. And you think, who has bewitched me? Friends, there is a river in you that has ability to convert a sea of evil into freshness of life. Praise be to the name of the Lord. And finally, I want to invite you to see the fruitfulness that comes with the river. The river passes through the desert. Can you imagine, okay, you may not have been privileged to go into a desert. But in a desert, you pour water and it disappears. You know, many rivers, when they get into the desert, they disappear. But this river that flows within us or from within us is the river of God. No desert can subdue it. There is no desert that can dry up the river of God in your life. Irrespective of what you are passing through, where you are passing through and when you have what it takes to convert a desert into a green place where there is life. A desert is an indicator of barrenness. There is no barrenness that can match or compete with the river of God. So I was thinking about barrenness. I remembered a few barren women of the Bible. And I know we can mention some. You know, barrenness is a life that has no productivity. 
from the beginning of life, we saw women that were labeled barren. But when they allowed the liver of God to flow in their lives, think about Sarah in the book of Genesis 11. Sarah gave birth at what age? Then let's go to Rebecca, Genesis 25. Okay, Sarah gave birth to who? To? Oh, I is okay. Then Rebecca gave birth to who? Now I can hear some of us come from the same mother tongue. That's called the sow. No, I think when we are in an English service, he is so not a sow. <laughs> Let's think about Rachel. All these women are women that had been labeled final. This one is barren. Friends, what are the situations in your lives that could have been labeled barren, not productive, not moving in any way? What about Hannah, the mother to Samuel? What about Elizabeth? The Bible has known situations that have changed simply because men and women followed God. And I don't know what barrenness is in your life. Situations in your life that looks hopeless. Situation in your life that looks like you cannot make it through. But I want to tell you, the God of those barren who transformed to be mothers of great men and women that were written off in the word of God is the same God who says, out of your life, there will flow springs of living waters. The dead sea becomes fresh. I don't know what is so, so dead about your life. Is it relationships? Is it that your family is not working? You look at your life and you thought finally when you got somebody who told you that they loved you, you thought, I, need, I have arrived. This is where I have always been going. But barely a few years, you cannot enjoy life because there are wars right, left, and center. In your family, there is no peace. There is deadness of joy. There is deadness of fulfillment. Friends, whatever situation that is dead in your life, the liver of God breathes life. Dead. Remember Jesus. Maybe before we go to Jesus. To think about another another prophet in a very few in few, very few minutes, you know Isaiah talks about the river. And in chapter forty one and eighteen, he says, "I will make rivers on barren heights and springs out of the valleys. I will turn deserts into the into pools of water, the parched ground into springs." Can you put your can you put your situation there? I will turn barren heights into springs of water. I will turn deserts into pools of water where there is no hope in your life. God can transform it into a pool of hope. Life can come back in your situation. Isaiah 43 and verse 19, Behold, I will do a new thing. Friends, the river comes with a new thing in your life. Maybe you have lived your life without drinking this water and you do not know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. I want to encourage you, try this water. Whoever drinks of this water out of his life, there will be a flow. And this flow will turn any nature of barrenness into fruitfulness. It will turn any situation of deadness into a living organism. As I sit here, as we sit here, as, I, as we sit here, as I stand, 
I see rivers that will start flowing. Every one of us is not a river, but many rivers. How I pray that as we leave this congregation, as we go to our homes, we are going to be the rivers that are going to transform the dead situations in our lives. And as I think about this period when we are praying and fasting, I was making fun on Wednesday. Uh, well, no, it was yesterday. When Jesus, some disciples of Jesus went to him and asked him, Jesus, sorry, not, not I, I'm referring to a different thing. I wanted to refer to a, a, a time when a man took his son to the disciples. He was sick and he desired, please pray for him that he may be healed. And the disciples prayed. Nothing was moving. Finally, the man gave up and went to Jesus personally and he asked him, Jesus, I have taken my son to your disciples and they cannot cast away these demons. And they, Jesus asked the, 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 the boy to be brought and he said, demons be cast off. The disciples got a little concerned and they went to him later on and they asked him, Jesus, what is happening? We have tried to pray and the demons could not move. Jesus told them, as I tell you, friends, such do not move with a full stomach. Some do not move when your stomach is full of gedari and ugari. Jesus realized the problem is not in the demons. The problem is in your stomach. And we are taking time now to fast as a church. And I want you to take time to name that demon that has refused to remove from your life. That situation that has, you, that has proved, proven stubborn. It has proved stubborn in your life. Could it be a situation at work? Could it be the situation back in your family? It has proved difficult and stubborn. Jesus says, with a, with a full stomach, nothing may not happen. But when you pray and fast, things do move. As we conclude, I want to ask you to name one and say, this particular time, I am fasting because of this situation that has refused to move. That the river of God will come, it will change the whole situation, even as we pray and fast. Allow me the prayer and uh, the, the, the prayer ministry to change a little bit of your program. So that when we go to our souls team today, we share situations that we are going through that need to be moved in this time and period of prayer and fasting. Every one of us take time to ask, is there something that I have prayed? Is, a, is it your mama? Is it your papa? Is it your brother? Is it your sister? You have prayed and it has proved to be stubborn. And you say, for this particular time, I am praying and I am fasting. And we will pray together. So when we go out in our sword team, I'm requesting that we may take that time to share our situation that have proven difficult and stubborn, that as a church, we will pray together and cause the river to throw you away, the river that will change. How I pray that we are going to unbrook and cause the river to flow. Jesus, expect of us that out of us there will be rivers that will bring others to eternal life. Shall we stand up?